The Radio Memories Network is brought to you in part by Liberated Syndication. Podcast publishing made easy. Libsyn.com. That's L-I-B-S-Y-N dot com. Agatha Christie and George Simeon present the best in mystery storytelling. Each show will be full of suspense, intrigue, and of course, mystery. Now let's join our featured mystery. Simenon's Maigre, a series of plays based on the novels of Georges Simenon. Hello, Georges. Ah, Georges. Good Lord, don't tell me you've been playing cards. Hmm? Patience. Yes, <laughs> just got out. Oh, I do now and again. And I don't cheat. Give it up. It's an old man's game. Well, then, my dear George, it's surely high time I took it up. Is it? You know, I've always held the theory that it's people who are fundamentally impatient that are given to the wretched game. So you're an exception. What? May Gray, the soul of patience. I don't think my chaps would agree with you there. If you were, you'd be somewhat dull, perhaps, Joe. I'd <laughs> be a blooming bore. There was one case of yours when you displayed monumental patience, I recall. For 20 years, in fact. 20 years? No, oh, never. You did, my old friend. A man called Palmari. A wheelchair. Doesn't that ring a bell? Ah, uh, of course. <laughs> yes, yes, it does, George. And to think I've forgotten. Manuel Palmari. Yes, they crippled him, but he was still the mastermind behind the pinching of precious stones and the fencing of them. And for 20 years, I'd tried to prove it. Maurice Denham as Jules Maigret and Michael Goff as Georges Simenon in The Patience of Megre, translated by Alistair Hamilton and adapted for radio by Frederick Bradnam. Good morning, Chief. Morning, Good morning, Chief. Morning, Chief. Good morning, Chief. Do you have a good weekend? Oh, couldn't have been better. The country was cooler than Paris, and I did a lot of gardening. More well, for me, that is. It's going to be hot today. July heat. I don't like July heat. Mm, you sound if you dislike everything this fine day, jean yeah. He does, Chief. He's up a cul-de-sac without a compass. Ah, huh? very funny. <laughs> no, look, Chief, this is the third breaking of a jeweller's window in two weeks. The same pattern. Two youngsters in stocking masks. A driver, also young. Dark-haired and sunburnt is the best we can do for descriptions. Break the window with a tire lever, sweep up the fancy goods and away. When was this last shot? Friday afternoon, the Boulevard du Montparnasse. And the whole point is that, like the other two shops, this shop had only put the valuable stuff in the window the day before. A new collection of emeralds. So, somebody knows something. Oh, for sure. A man in the trade. Somebody who does the round of the jewellers, but probably not selling jewels. If he sees the windows full of the right stuff, he sounds the alert, and the boys come in from the country. It's been going on for 20 years. Yes, I remember you saying. I tried traps. I've checked on hundreds of commercial travellers. Yeah, I've kept two chaps watching Palmari's place, as you suggested. I bet it's Jeanne who follows Palmari's girlfriend, Aline Bosch, when she bounces down to the shop. Yeah, and she's given him the slip once or twice. Otherwise, nothing. Oh, I'll, I'll get it. Oh, there it is. You have to be patient. I have for 20 years. 20 years? <laughs> like old Joe. Yes, yes, and I'm still right. sure Manuel Palmari is and always has been the boss. Palmari? Yeah. What? Yes, I'll, I'll tell him at once. Did you say Palmari? Yes, Chief. He's been killed in his flat. Hmm? Found shot in his wheelchair. Talk of the devil, eh? Oh. <laughs> oh, well, I was rather fond of the old man. 20 years, eh? Now, come on, both of you. The sooner we're on the spot, the better. Uh, tell me what you know, Claire Dar. And where's Aline Bosch? In her room, Chief. Uh, jean Vier, go and keep Aline company, will you? Mm. I'll join you in a moment. Right, Chief. It's the door at the end of the passage. Yeah, thanks. Is she... Um... Yes, 
She's lived with Palmari for four or more years now. Thirty years or so younger. We took her from the streets. She looked after him well, like a nurse. So, what do you know? Not much. The men are going through the place now, as you can see. Aline Bosch says she gave him his breakfast, washed him, went out to the shops, leaving him in his wheelchair. Mm. This about nine. The usual routine, it seems. She got back at five to ten. She saw the mantelpiece clock and found him dead. I see. Where's the body now? Well, we finished with the cameras, so the doctor had it taken into the bedroom. Uh, Le Pointe, ask the doc if he's anything for me, will you? Y- yes, Chief. What time did you get the call? From Aline, I think. It was logged at exactly 10.15, and yes, she made the call. 10.15? You asked her why it took her 20 minutes. Well, I haven't asked her anything very much. But I wondered if she was back later than she said. Oh, the chaps watching the play should confirm it or not. Send somebody down to ask them in a moment. Yeah. What else? Uh, the body had slipped to the floor. There was a lot of blood. Hmm. Ah, Dr. Paul, nobody told me it was you. Uh, get that man down to the chaps watching the place clear. Though. Her time back is important. I'll do it myself. Who else did you think it would be? <laughs> what I meant was nobody said Dr. Paul. <laughs> anyway, can you tell me anything of interest? Well, three shots were fired into him. The one that probably killed him was fired from behind, into the back of the neck and up into the brain pan at point blank, just about. The other two? Into his chest, from the front. They missed the heart and were fired from... A few feet back. They wouldn't have killed him at once, or at all, probably. Oh, thanks, Doctor. Have we got the weapon, Laplante? There was a Smith & Wesson 38 on the floor, Chief. I gather that the girl said it was Palmari's. A Smith & Wesson 38, Doctor? Yes, I would have said that was about right. I'll let you know for certain when I've done the postmortem. Mm-hmm. Good. Mm-hmm. Laplante? Yes. Go and have the usual word with the concierge, get a list of the tenants... And ask her if she saw anybody come in between Aline's leaving and returning. Yes, Chief. Go uh, in Lapointe. Yeah? See if she knows who takes the rent, the landlord or his agent. Right. Ah, uh, Claire Don, what about those times? Inspector Shannon followed her around the shops. She set out at about 9.3 and returned back at 9.53, which gives her two minutes to get up to the flat. Mm. The other detective confirms these times. Well, it adds up. She was back at 9.55. They saw nobody else enter the building? Nobody but the butcher's boy who delivered meat to the concierge. Yes, and it was somebody already in the building, or... Hmm. No, thank you, Claire. Oh. I suppose it's time I had a word with the girl. The door at the end of the passage, you said? That's it, Chief Inspector. Mm. Uh, uh. Well, Jean Vier, you're looking after Mademoiselle Bosch nicely. Not easy, Chief. Mm. She doesn't seem to like us. Oh, I know that, don't I, Ali? I don't want to talk to you, pig. On the other hand, I had a soft spot for Manuel Palmari. As villains go, he wasn't a bad chap. I'm sorry he's dead, Ali. And don't you think I am? Poor Daddy. Why did they have to pick on him? Who did pick on him? I don't bloody know, do I? It's just awful, awful. I know. And it's murder, too. Yeah, you think I killed him, don't you? You think I did it? You would, you I would. Go pour her a drink, Jean Vier. Right, Chief. There's <laughs> some brandy. Uh, just the thing. <laughs> no, Alan, I know you didn't kill him. Here you are, Mademoiselle. Uh, drink that and listen. Look, try to help me. I want to find who it was who killed him. For the moment, I just want to ask you one or two questions. Well, what do you want to know? Uh, that's better. Now, first, where did Manuel keep his revolver during the day? In his little corner room, where he always sat. Behind the radio so that he could reach it. Mm, Of course. When you came back from shopping this morning, where did you go first? Into which room? (sighs) Well, I think I went in the kitchen. Well, I usually do, unless Manuel calls me as I come in. I put the things down that I've bought. Well, I must have done that. Well, let's ask Jean Vier to go and see, shall we? Okay, Chief. Were they in a bag, Mademoiselle? In a string bag, yeah. And then you went into the little room to see if Manuel was all right. Yeah, like I always do. Did you see that he was dead? I saw that he was on the floor. There was a lot of blood. I think I screamed, you know. I I saw the gun. Aline, almost 20 minutes passed before you phoned the police. Did you think of calling a doctor at once? No. No, I mean, he, he, he looked so dead. I mean, he was obviously dead. So what did you do? For almost 20 minutes? 
You're trying to catch me out, aren't you? You bloody would. Soft soapy me first. Then a lot of tricky questions. Look, there's nothing tricky about my question, Ali. No. Nothing. What did you do for almost 20 minutes? The shopping's on the kitchen table, Chief. Still in its bag. Ah, thank you. Oh, Jean Vier, if you found a body, what would be the first thing you'd do? Ring the police and then the doctor. Yeah. You took 20 minutes to do one of those things, Ali. I don't know. I, I, I just stood there for, well, I don't know, minutes. After that, I think I walked up and down the flat. I mean, just sort of talking to myself. I don't know for how long. I mean, I wasn't looking at the blooming clock, was I? And then I, well, I thought I'd better let you lot know. All right, Ali, and it makes sense. You'll have to be tested, the gunpowder test, to see if you fired the gun. I didn't kill him. Monsieur Maigret, he was everything to me. I mean, my, my man, my child and my father. Mm. I'll have to leave somebody in the flat with you. <clears throat> well, I'll get you a relief, jean once they've cleared up in the other rooms. Oh, yes, Chief. Thanks. Now, do you know your neighbours in this building, Ali? No. You know that Manuel wouldn't have much to do with anyone. Well, he couldn't, could he? Well, I'm sure that the concierge knows all I need to know, and I'm sure La Pointe has discovered all about everybody. I'm truly sorry, Ali. He should have been left alone. Ah. I've covered the top floor, Chief. That's the seventh, isn't it? Yes, it's attics, really. Most have lived in by the maids. There's an old man in one room who's deaf and dumb, uh, Jeff Klaas. Mm. He was wounded in an air raid in Belgium in 1940. Where are we going now? Third floor, Chief. Huh? Where you've just come from. La, la Pointe. No, 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 have... seriously, mm. Chief. The couple in the flat on Palmari's landing were both out. In the barrier. He'll be out all day, but his wife is only shopping, and the concierge tells me she's back. Mm. Well, I thought you'd like to see her yourself. Ah, uh, uh, here we are. Yeah. Who owns the block? Does she know? Well, she's the obstructive sort of concierge. But I got out of it that Palmari did own the building up until a few months ago. And now? It's in the name of Mademoiselle Aline Bosch. Is it? You must have loved her. Give the bell a ring. Right. I imagine Palmari was pretty well off, Chief, wasn't he? Well, I'd say yes, but I don't know. I can only guess. Ah, uh, Madame Barilla? Yes. Do come in. Uh, thank you. You're the police, I'm sure. And you're the famous Chief Inspector Maigret. That I know. Uh, Inspector Lapointe and I would like to ask you what you know, if anything, about the business next door. Come into the sitting room, please. Yes. Do sit down. Thank I you. saw the police pouring into the flat. I asked one of them, and he told me that Monsieur Palmari had been shot. What time did you leave to go shopping, madame? I went to the market, so I went early, say, just after eight, and I only arrived back about ten or so. And your husband, madame Barilla, he left when? Well, I don't know. He was here when I went off, gone when I got back. Ah, he has no regular routine, then? Oh, he's a sales representative, so his hours are pretty flexible. I think that today... He was going to some suburban shops. Mm, what is his line of country, madam? Country? Oh, I see. He represents a firm that makes deluxe packings uh, for chocolate or perfumery or jewellery or watches, that sort of thing. Today, uh, he probably left about 9.30. Did you know Manuel Balmari? No. I knew he was crippled, and I sometimes heard him cry out. Uh, cry out? Uh, not in pain, with a sort of anger, a frustration... But we've lived here for five years, and I've never seen him. And Aline Bosch? Did you know her at all? That's her name, is it? Aline? Oh, no. She's downright unfriendly. At first, I used to say hello, but she'd look right through me. Well, thank you, Madame Maria. Tell me, uh, you're not French, am I correct? No, monsieur. I come from Belgium. I came as a little girl. I see well, one of us or both of us will come back this evening to have a word with your husband. If he was here until 9.30, he may have heard or seen something. I will tell him, monsieur. We rarely go out in the evenings. I suppose, being maigre, you already know who killed the poor man. That's what comes of having a reputation as a master detective, Jules. <laughs> <laughs> Take one look at the scene of the crime and you know who did it. Immediately. Quiet. 
Well, at this stage, of course, I didn't know who'd done it, but I had formed an opinion. Well, hadn't you? The paraffin test proved negative on Aline. Mm, it did. But she could have worn rubber kitchen gloves. If it wasn't her, then it was somebody else that Manuel trusted implicitly. Somebody who had the key of the flat and could come and go when they wanted, and who knew where the revolver was kept. Agreed. But Jean Vier had had that building watched day and night for a month. There wasn't a single visitor in that time for either Manuel or Aline. And on the morning of the murder, nobody but the butcher's boy had so much as crossed the threshold except for the tenants. And only two of them had entered the place between nine and ten, Aline and Madame Barilla. So we're left with the uncomfortable fact that if it wasn't Aline, and why should she kill her protector, it was somebody else living in that block of flats. Well, the plant went through that building thoroughly. And some of the tenants were away, and the rest were totally unlikely to be murderers for any and every reason La Pointe and I could think of. Now, Jules, wait a moment. One man. Ah, yes, one man. We had to see him later, of course. I imagine that Aline didn't ring the doctor because she knew Manuel was dead. Because she knew he was meant to be dead. Mm, it followed, Georges. It followed, rather. And during the 20 minutes before she rang the police, I think she was using the phone. And... There were a lot of people to let know that Manuel was dead. Mm. I thought I'd find out about that. I saw to it that not a word of the murder got in the press that day. I knew that Manuel owned a restaurant in the Rue Fontaine, the Clou d'Arrêt. And early that evening I visited it with young La Pointe. Good evening, Monsieur Maigret, Monsieur Lapointe. Uh, good evening to you, Pernel. Evening. Have a drink with me? I was wondering if you'd call in. Oh, yeah, I'll have a Pernel, thank you. Lapointe? Uh, a beer, thank you. Uh, Danish, please. Ah, I'll serve you myself. The farmer's busy moving crates around. Yeah, no, ice and water. Mm. Uh, what do you think of it? Huh? Must have been an old score, eh? Pernel, Monsieur? Thank you. Any ideas? Well, not many. When did you first hear of it, Pernell? Oh, I don't know. Uh, beer, Monsieur Lapointe. Ah, thanks. I was being talked about in here by lunchtime. Why do you ask? Mm, cheers. Tell him, Lapointe. Well, it was kept under wraps. There's nothing in the evening press, not a reporter in sight. Oh, search me. All I can tell you is that the buzz was going around the restaurant by lunchtime. Mm, do you own this place now, Pernell? <laughs> you talk about the news getting around. I bought it five days ago, in fact. Oh, I was thinking aloud. You bought it from Manuel, did you? Just in time. Oh, you make that sound as if it had some connection with his death. Well, it may have had. Not that you know. Actually, the restaurant was owned by Arlene Bush. Hmm? Manuel signed it over to her a couple of years ago. Hmm. Oh, your first customers are coming in, I see. Ah, excuse me. Hmm. <coughs> Arlene must be a rather rich young woman, Chief. Yes. You see that fat, rather red-faced man? Yeah. Louis something or other. An old friend of Manuel's, wasn't he? Oh, once, certainly. He's registered that we're here. If he leaves, follow him. I suspect he may try to phone the news of our presence to somebody. Right. I'll do my best to get the number, too. Yes. Ah, they're old friend of Manuel's. No, uh, they know the news. Yeah, I wonder what else they know. Manuel was very clever, you know, Pernell. He would give me information... He would even sometimes hand over to me the occasional small fish. Well, if he did that, monsieur, in his line of business, then no wonder they crippled him once and killed him this time. Uh, excuse me, chief. I must make a phone call. Uh, the crippling was one thing, the killing quite another. Tell me, Pernell, do you know of any other property Manuel may have owned? Well, the building you lived in? Ah, but you'd know that, wouldn't you? Uh, there was a hotel in the Rue de l'Etoile. Hmm? The Bussier, a house of call, I've been told. Mm, that's useful. Now, the point is, if there is a point, somebody shot Manuel at close range. Something he wasn't expecting. To tell the truth, Chief Inspector, I thought... I, I mean, remember, many of his friends still use this restaurant. I, uh, I hear things. Mm. I thought Manuel had retired, shall we say. Oh, his sort of villain doesn't retire. Oh, I think he was still setting things up. Well, that's no secret either. Yeah, what sort of things? I mean, I'm an innocent. Yeah, keep that way. 
Jewel robberies, breaking shop windows, and that part is simple. The selling is the difficult thing. Ah, yes, yes. Descriptions of the missing jewels are circulated. I'm told that all stones are traceable. They have their own identity. Ah, there's Louis back. I can't uh, remember his surname. Oh, I didn't notice him going. But I only know him as Monsieur Louis. Mm. Now, the stones are sold to a fence and eventually put back on the market and more than usually traced, or say, 60% of the time. Only the stuff stolen in the cases which I'm sure involved our dead friend never, it seems, came to light. Ah, which means, need I tell you of all people, they're unset and recut, transformed. That's it. Only we've never been able to find the cutter. It's almost entirely a family trade. There's only about oh, 50 of them in the whole of Paris, in one district, a very closed little set. Perhaps another 50 in the whole of France. Now, a crooked diamond cutter should be easy to find, but that car... Ah, here's our young inspector coming mm. back. Uh, will you excuse me? Oh, yes, of course, and thank you for listening to me. Monsieur Laplace. Hello. Oh, <laughs> he went and phoned, Chief. Yes, I guessed as much. Drink your beer. You look as though you deserve it. Yeah, I think I do. Mm. <sighs> well, I got a good view of him from the other box. He mm. dialed double four six eight four two, then three nine or three eight. Yeah. So I got through to the K and asked them to find the subscribers. There's no one on three eight, but three nine is the number of one Fernand Barria. Ah, good, Lapointe. Very good. It's the sort of break we get rarely enough. I need to visit Fernand Barria, as indeed I said I would. Have you got enough to hold him on? I don't think so, not yet. Things are tying up. Now, I want you to have a look at the other end of the knot. Right, Chief. Now, Pernell tells me that Manuel owned a rather dubious hotel. I've written it down. Ah. Hotel Boussière, Rue de l'Etoile. Yes, now go there, take a room if you have to. Oh, and uh, take this. Yeah. It's a photo of Aline. Right. Discover if she visits by herself or with anybody. She's given Jeanne the slip more than once and done so recently. Your room, monsieur? Uh, thank you. Uh, you'd like a pretty girl, wouldn't you? Uh, no, uh, no, not really. Well, there's enough of them downstairs. Oh, you're one of them, are you? No, I am not. I'm only interested in one girl at present. I have a photo of her. Well, what do you want to know? I want to know if you know her. Know her? Come off it, of course I know her. She's the blinking proprietress, isn't she? The owner of this high-class knocking shop. Oh, that's interesting. I don't get it. Or do I? You're the police, aren't you? Does she come here often? Yes. It's not so much as usual this last month. You won't breathe a word who told you, will you? <sighs> not a whisper. What's her name? Madame Bosch. That's what we know her as. Does she have an office here? She has a room in a sitting room. Does she have any visitors? I don't watch, do I? I have a lot to do. Mm, like pimping for the guests. Well, there's one chap. About 40. Dark hair and a thin moustache. Well-dressed. Always has a small suitcase. Does he? The sort that sales reps carry, is it? That's it. That's what he is, I'd say. That or a very successful brothel keeper, like Madame Bosch. Hmm. Perhaps. I'm sure they discuss business. Oh, they do that too, with the other. Hmm. <laughs> and I know they do that. I don't know any more, though, I swear. Uh, good evening, Madame la Concierge. Good evening, Monsieur Maigret. Madame Berliard told me you'd be back to have a word with that flashy husband of hers. Yes, he is in, I presume, Madame. For the last hour, looking as pleased with himself as usual. Mm. Well, good evening, Monsieur. <laughs> He's deaf and dumb, old Jeff Klaus. Good evening, Monsieur Jeff. He can lip read. Mm. This is Chief Inspector Maigret, Jeff. Police. I don't think he wants to see you. No, Monsieur Class, thank you. I am told he's not yet 70, though he seems older. All but for his hands. Steady as rocks they are. Does he do any work, do you know? He makes toys, pretty things. He has a workshop room up in the attic. 
terribly badly wounded he was all around the head in some air raid in Belgium in 1940, so he became deaf and dumb. Mm, do you know where he comes from in Belgium, by any chance? I do, monsieur, from Antwerp. He has written things down for me to read. Oh, thank you, madame. You've been most helpful. It's Chief Inspector Megne, Fernand. Oh, thank you, Mina. Good evening, monsieur. Good evening. Do come in. Thank you. Uh, please sit down, Chief Inspector. Thank you. Oh, I understand you're a sales representative. I, I told him, Fernand, what you did. And why shouldn't you? The police like to know such things. Mm. Did you have a long round today, monsieur? I left about 9.30, went to the Lila district. You visit any jewellers by any chance? Not today. The Lila district doesn't go in for jewellery, <laughs> or goes into the centre for it. I suppose people phone you here about your work? Uh, yes, I do nearly everything from home. I thought you wanted to ask me about this morning. This morning? What about this morning? For crying out loud, a man was killed just across the landing. Oh, Manuel Palmari, a villain. I don't suppose you knew him. No, I didn't know him. Nor did I know the woman he lived with. Uh, Mademoiselle Aline Bosch. Mm. Did you hear a shot this morning? No, I'm afraid I didn't. Oh, don't be afraid. Manuel Palmari was murdered by a ghost, I think. And ghosts come and go without being seen and fire shots that aren't heard. I don't find that particularly funny. Oh. Well, let's see if I can make you laugh in this way, then. This evening you had a phone call from a restaurant, the Clou Doré, from a man called Louis. Oh. It doesn't amuse you? Mina, leave us alone, please. Oh, yes, Fernand. I don't understand. There is a misunderstanding, darling. I'll explain when I've cleared it up. All right, Fernand, if you say so. I'm against bringing women into business on principle. <laughs> now, you said something funny which I find amusing. What the hell's funny about it? I prefer my wife to be kept out of this kind of thing, that's all. Yes, I can believe that. Have you known Louis for long? No, not for long, and only as a customer. Ah, of course, a customer. He was a friend of the dead man, did you know that? It's a small world, isn't it? Sometimes it is. Palmari must have had the same business connections that I had. Yes, I think he may well have. And perhaps the same business partner. That is why I find your women and business remark rather funny, Barriard. Monsieur Barriard, if you please. Oh. Uh, may I use your telephone, Monsieur Barriard? If you must, it's over there. Mm, thanks. Well, what other nonsense have you to say to me? Hmm? <laughs> you really think I'm talking nonsense? Now, yeah. uh, who's there? No, oh, you, Jean, is it? How's our alley? Hmm? Is she? Well, I'll be across in a few minutes. Look, do this for me, will you? Ring the K and ask them to send another man to the building. Yes, to keep an eye on one Fernand Barrier. What? Not to let him out of his sight. Now, listen. I'll give him a description of the man when he gets here. Good. Thank you. Well, we'll take a few minutes for a chap to get here, Monsieur Barriard, so you'll have to put up with my company until then. I have some returns to make. Would you like the television on? Oh, no, thank you. Have you finished? We have. Come in and entertain the chief inspector. You haven't done anything wrong, have you, Fernand? No, my lamb, of course not. It's all in his mind. Mm, you keep a record of all the shops you visit, I take it? Good Lord, no. Only those I sell to. I don't like paperwork. Uh, sometime it'll be interesting to compare that list with the list we have, a very short list, of jeweller's shops which have been broken into this last month. What is this? What can stolen jewellery have to do with Fernand? Uh, 200 of type 6, 150 of type 10, 50 of the chocolate, type 2, 100 of type 7, 300 of type 5. That was a good order. Uh, I'll go. No, let your husband answer it, madam. It's for both of us, in a way. Don't worry, Mina. You know that the police can get hold of the wrong end of the stick at times. I'm sorry to have caused you distress, madame. You want the chief inspector, I take it? Uh, yes, please, sir. Ah, Baron, they sent you. Good. Now, take a good look at Monsieur Barriard and don't let him out of your sight wherever he goes. 
Right, Chief. I've got him. Good night, Barry R. Good night. <laughs> you seem to have upset him, Chief. Not as much as I'm going to. Now, I don't think he'll try anything, but park the car opposite and keep your eyes skinned. All right, Chief. Are you coming down? No, I've got another client on this floor. All right. <sighs> we'll be just as glad to see me. Oh, coming, Chief. Yeah. The lady's looking forward to seeing you. <laughs> I told her she ought to get dressed for you, but she said... I'm she... sure he'd much rather see me half-dressed. Bloody men. They're all bastards. I've just been talking to one, Harry. Fernand Barriard, who lives less than a stone's throw away. Attractive chap, I'd say, to women. Should I know him? Well, as the landlady, you should know all your tenants. Oh, don't get lost. And he appears to know a friend of Manuel's called Louis. A friend of yours also is Louis, isn't he? Louis who? Huh. <laughs> you don't catch me like that, Megray. Well, Aline, have you anything to tell me? Only that I wish I'd never set eyes on you. Yes, that may well be true, my girl. Did you know that Fernand Barriard was in the jewellery game also, like Manuel? It's a small world, isn't it, Magrin? Mm, that's what I said to him. Well, I'll be off. Barriard has a very nice wife, you know, Ali. Very gentle and kind. Odd, isn't it? I mean, how cold devils like our Fernand find nice girls to marry. No doubt their mistresses are quite different. More like you in temperament, I'd say. Maybe I remember this case as well, if not better, than usual. Because for the most of it, you were working by normal deductive methods, not by your usual instinctive, or shall we say, psycho-instinctive methods. Is that fair? Mm, I think so, Georges. Although one look at Fernand Barriard, and I was sure he and Aline belonged together. And that was before Lapointe had reported to me on his hotel findings. It was a neat setup, wasn't it? Barriard as the next door neighbour. It's a wonder Manuel hadn't filled the entire building with his workforce. Well, he only wanted two or three near him. Aline and Fernand as his eyes and ears of the world of precious stones beyond his reach, and one other. Ah, yes, the cutter of precious stones, the magician who transformed stones so they would not be recognised. Was he near? Well, that's where my so-called psycho-instinctive methods were letting me down. I knew that the answer was apparent. I'd seen it. And without realising, it tucked it away in the recesses of my mind. Where it could not be found without some help. <laughs> I even dreamed strange dreams around my cutter of precious stones. Dreams where I knew him, but he had no name, no face. And then you went to see a diamond merchant. One Berenstein. Taking Jean Vier with you. They call this the precious stone market, Jean Vier. Well, they look like a lot of middle aged foreign gents doing nothing and talking 19 to a dozen. But if you watch carefully, passing stones to each other that are frequently worth many hundreds of thousands, and nothing on paper. Well, it's nice to know there's some trust left in the world. Mm, there's our chap, Berenstein. Yeah, Monsieur Berenstein. Ah! My friend, Maigret, I have made the inquiries you asked me to. Oh, well, that's good of you. This is Inspector Jean Vier, Berenstein. How do you do, monsieur? Pleased to know you. Now, Maigret, before the war in 1940, the main stone-cutting centre was Antwerp, yes? Curiously, most of the cutters were, and still are, from the Baltic. In Antwerp, they had foreign cards, you understand. Now, what happened when the Germans got to Antwerp in 1940? They fled to Royan. Most finished up in the United States, although they've nearly all returned. Now, wait. Could some of them have got to France? Some did, I'm told. But as they were almost all Jews, they did not last very long. But one of them may have done. Thank you, Bernstein. Thank you. Come on, Jean-Vier. Chief? To the car and to where old deaf and dumb Jeff Glass makes toys in an attic. He's not in his room. No, which is his workshop, madame? Oh, all this fuss and I have work to do. This is the room. There's no point in knocking. He can't hear, can he? <gasps> what? what is it? Oh, look, he's hanging. Yeah, oh, I think he's dead. Oh, oh, the shock has put years on me. Oh, do shut up, woman. 
this and make yourself useful. Go downstairs and get the two detectives outside to come up. Hurry, hurry. Strange how many people seeing a man foully done to death can only think of themselves. Yeah. Why would he hang himself? Just a minute, Chief. That bruise. Yes. I'd say to guess that he was killed last night, probably when he was asleep, dragged in here and then strung up. The forensic boy should be able to tell us that. And he cut the stones, did he? Yes, he did. We'll find his tools when we look. And although deaf and dumb and a bit daft, he knew much too much. Ah, poor old chap, I could have saved him. I understood the thing when I first saw him and took no notice of my own understanding. Chief! Chief, it's Chateau Lapointe. Do you want us up there? Uh, Lapointe, bring Barriard, will you? Don't take no for an answer. Right, Chief. So for 20 years he's been cutting the stolen stuff. Mm. Was he Manuel's find or Barriard? Oh, no, Barriard's too young. No, I have an idea that he was Mina Barriard's find. What? Only she's never known the use he was put to. She was in it too? Mm. You'll let her come up, Lapointe. She is, Chief. Ahead of us. Oh, Barrio, up you go. Oh, you know, in some ways, I would rather have her not see him dead. On the other hand... Yeah, it must be very easy to kill a deaf old Jim. man in his bed. Chief Inspector, I don't understand why you... Oh! Oh! Oh, Chef. Yes, I think he was killed, Mina. And then strung up on that rope. Oh, who would do that to Chef? Why would they? Chief! Mm. Uh, uh, Le Pointe, Jeanne, in here. My wife oh, has no man. part in this. Can't we keep her out of it? I want you to explain to your wife why you had to kill Jeff Class. There is nothing to explain. And I'd rather not talk about things in front of her, if you don't mind. And yet you've been using her for years. How I'm grateful of you to deny her an explanation. Is this something to do with the man's death downstairs? Palmari, tell me, Fernand, tell me. He's trapped me, don't you see? Anything I say... I never trapped you, you fool. You trapped yourself. It has everything to do with Palmari's death, Mina. Since your husband won't explain, I will. Palmari was a gangster. One form of crime he organised was the stealing of precious stones from the windows of jewellery shops. Fernand found the shops, and along with Aline Bosch, did the contacting and so on. Jeff Class cut the precious stone so they could be sold safely. Jeff would not know he was doing wrong. Agreed. But Fermat here would. I think Palmari has used Jeff for years. Twenty years. Long before your husband came into the game. I never had a single suspicion. What a fool I am. But tell me, Monsieur Maigret, why all this murdering? Aline and your husband became greedy. And they were lovers. Oh, no. So, having shot Palmari, they had to cover their tracks. Simple-minded though he was, class could be used to testify against them. There's not a word of truth in any of it, Mina. There is, Mina. It's all true. I shall prove it. Some is already proved. Of what? I know that your husband and Aline Bosch met regularly at a hotel owned by her. Oh! Mm. Manuel Palmari must have loved her, you know. He gave her so much. This block of flats, the hotel, the restaurant. They would have lived well together with Aline and her lover. Take him away, shall I? Okay, Chief. Come on, Bayard. Down we go. Don't believe them, Mina. But how can I believe you? I'll leave you two to do what's necessary. Right, Chief. Meet me in Manuel's flat in about half an hour. I'll go there after I've heard Mina's story. It was near Antwerp. A railway station. I was four, I think... And with my mother. We were with hundreds of other refugees. Well, most of this I've found out since I remember very little. Only as if I'm remembering bits of an old film seen long ago. You understand? Yes, I understand, Mina. There were suddenly some terrible explosions and awful screaming and a foul smell. It was an air raid. I've since discovered that it killed half of us. Then the world went black for me. And when I woke, I was being nursed by this... this tall man with a bandage round his head. I never saw my mother again. And when I asked this tall man for her, he didn't reply. I can't compare my childhood with any other childhood. 
or him to any other foster father. We wandered everywhere. I recall soldiers and police and living in huts and trains and once in a cave. If we were questioned, neither of us could understand or reply. So they left you alone? Oh, yes. The name class. Oh, and a piece of paper pinned to my dress. Hmm. Later we came to Paris and eventually he obtained a false card, a Jeff class, and I became officially his granddaughter. This was at the end of the war. How did you live? Jeff had gold coins sewn into his clothes. We never went without, and although he was deaf and dumb and simple in the head, he knew how to survive. After the war, he worked for jewelers, and he found me a job as a sales girl with one of them. And that was how you met Fernand? Yes. Jeff and I had a small house. His workshop was in the garden. And when I married Fernand, we came here. Do you think Fernand married me to... To keep things in the family? Probably. I loved Jeff. I owe my life to him. Fernand I, I only respected. And Fernand killed him. With that woman. You'll find somebody else one day, Mina. You know you will. Now I must pay a last visit to that woman. Ah, here you are, Chief. Yes. Jean Vier and I have told Aline what the score is. Mm. Sit down, Aline. The Chief wants a word with you. I fooled you, didn't I, Mayor Gray? Mm. You thought I couldn't have killed old Manuel. Manuel fell in love with you, and it's fatal to fall in love with your sort of woman. Gave you everything. Taught you how to behave. Everything. The only thing he didn't have to teach you was how to count. But you didn't actually kill him, did you? I would have done it. For Fernand, I would. You and Fernand belong to the jungle, a beast and his mate. No, you took Manuel's gun, put it in your bag, kissed him goodbye, went out and met Fernand coming from his flat. You gave Fernand the gun and went and did your shopping while your young lover shot your old lover. Now you're going to take Fernand to one place and me to another. I hate you, Maigre. I hate you. Come on, Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. She managed to scratch your face quite thoroughly, if I remember rightly. Yes, I deserved it, for letting them kill old class. From the moment Mina told me she came from Belgium as a little girl, I should have seen the Antwerp connection. Ah, oh, come, Jules, you're being very hard on yourself. No, I became too interested in the obvious clues to who killed Manuel. I thought, tie that up, and I'd find how the stones were transformed and who the magician was. The story of Mina Glass and old Jeff is something apart. Hmm? A deaf and dumb man, probably of Jewish origin, simple-minded, and a little child, wandering France for some four years of the occupation. What a childhood to live through. Mm. They would have been entirely in a world of their own, wouldn't they, for their separate reasons. They would never give themselves away. So they survive. That's true, Georges. And I think that Mina found her true happiness later. She deserved it. She did. As the others deserved what they got. And I think we deserve a drink. Do you agree? Mm. It had to be a farewell one for the present, Georges. Why not? We're forever saying farewell to the present, Jew. <laughs> In The Patience of Maigret by Georges Simonon, translated by Alistair Hamilton and adapted for radio by Frederick Bradnam, Maigret was played by Maurice Denham and Simonon by Michael Goff. La Pointe, John Rye, Jean Vier, Sean Barrett, Inspector Clairdon, William Edel, Janin, Malcolm Gerard, Fernand Barria, Julian Glover, Mina Barria, Emily Richard, Aline Bosch, Julia Foster, Berenstein, Alan Dudley, Pernell, Malcolm Hayes, the Hotel Porter, Eric Cotter, and the concierge, Anita Sharp Polster. The play was produced and directed by Glyn Dearman. <laughs>